The internet is rife with stories of fast food controversy, be it reports of contaminated meals being served to customers, vile instances of employee misconduct, or videos showcasing psychotic customer meltdowns. There's something about fast food restaurants. It's like the most mind-boggling scenarios play out at these places. And the online world just can't seem to get enough of these tales. In this installment of Fast Food Disasters, we'll be looking at some of the most infamous fast food fiascos out there, and I couldn't think of a better place to start than the Wendy's gator throwing incident. Many of you watching may be familiar with a mean-spirited prank that's often pulled on hapless fast food workers. That prank being fire in the hole. The act involves a delinquent fast food customer ordering a large soft drink at a drive through window only to then hurl the drink back at the restaurant worker, drenching the poor soul in the process. Sadly, fire in the hole has become a time-tested prank, popular for multiple generations of young people at this point. And Surprisingly, dozens have actually been criminally prosecuted for performing this stunt. But of the many disturbing examples of fire in the hole being performed, no instance tops the time a live alligator was involved. The story begins in October of 2015 with 23 year old Florida man Joshua James. Joshua James had been described as somewhat of an outdoorsman, a Florida redneck with a penchant for animal wrestling. Friends of the man say that Joshua recreationally caught snakes, lizards, and most importantly to this story, alligators. On one October day, Josh and a small group of associates managed to wrangle a gator, a young one, approximately three and a half feet in length. Initially aggressive and thrashing, the wild reptile would eventually become docile likely exhausted from its fight with the Florida men. With a live gator now in their possession, the boys begin to ask themselves, what next? Fried gator? A new pet? Release the poor thing? None of the above. Joshua James and his friends, likely inspired by some of the viral fire in the hole videos on social media at the time, decided they'd put their own Florida spin on the already dangerous prank. They decided instead of throwing soda at a fast food employee, they would throw their live alligator into a drive through window. The story goes that Joshua and one of his gator wrangling accomplices would later pull up to the Wendy's drive through restaurant located in Royal Palm Beach, Florida. The men ordered a drink and then drove up to the drive through window to meet the unfortunate soul on the receiving end of their devious stunt. During the drive through interaction, the worker turned their back to the group and seeing their opportunity, Josh pulled the gator from the back seat of his truck and hurled the tormented reptile through the drive through window. The startled beast hissed as it landed inside Wendy, sending workers into a panic. The cashier was so terrified by the presence of the alligator, she jumped out of the drive through window as Josh sped away in his truck. The gator-tossing gang likely feeling that they'd committed the greatest act of fire in the hole in history. And while this may be true, the act would come with consequences, as not only did Josh and his friends harm the gator by throwing it, they petrified everybody inside of the Wendy's restaurant. Wendy's management would notify authorities over the gator inside of their facility. It was later captured and released back into the wild by Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation officers. They traced the soft drink purchased at the time of the gator throwing back to Joshua James. After a thorough investigation, the man was arrested several months later. He was taken into custody where he would confess to being the Wendy's gator thrower. As a result of his alligator antics, Joshua was facing some pretty serious charges. The most remarkable of these charges being aggravated assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to do less than murder and unlawful possession of a gator. After being arrested and charged, the man posted bail and was released from jail. Shortly after getting out, Joshua was approached by a group of journalists and he agreed to do an ad hoc interview with them. And the man was rather candid in the interview, saying that he didn't mean any harm by his stunt, he just wanted to do something funny. And he also claims that he had a friend that worked at the Wendy, so he thought it wouldn't be that big of a deal if he threw the gator in there. Well. You were wrong about that, pal. Yeah. So the person you threw it at was your friend or no? No, no, it was a different person. But I'm sure he's working there at the time and got a chance to see it. So. Do you have anything to say to the people at Wendy's? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry for what I did. I mean, you know, just being stupid, not thinking. And obviously I found out what the consequences were and I got to pay for them. So 
And so you never meant to harm anybody yourself? No, absolutely not. I never meant for anybody to get hurt or anything like that. You know, it was just, it was a good laugh kind of thing, yeah. In May of 2016, Joshua would plead guilty to his charges, which had been slightly softened. These charges included misdemeanor assault and unlawful possession of a gator. The man was given 12 months of probation and compelled to complete 75 hours of community service, and he had to pay a fine and court cost of $1,200. A Florida wildlife worker commented on the judge's sentencing. He may have thought this was something funny he was doing, but I've been bitten by alligators. I've seen what alligators can do, and I think that's probably something the judge took a look at. The gator tosser's disregard for public safety landed him a criminal record. Our next fast food disaster story involves another highly ignorant man, a man so dumb that he posted a video of himself committing a fast food related crime onto YouTube. When you're surfing the web, it's often common to see articles and videos showcasing secret menu items and menu hacks. One fast food hack out there is actually illegal to participate in, which brings us to the topic of the Del Taco scammer. Meet Robert Echeverria. In 2008, Robert was featured in a rough shot video published to YouTube titled How to Scam Del Taco. This infamous video showcased Robert making a call to his local Del Taco restaurant wherein he attempts to trick the restaurant workers into giving him free food under the pretense that they had screwed up a previous order he had made, which he never actually made an order. Robert and his affiliates shot this video in the parking lot of the very Del Taco that they would wind up scamming. The act took place in Rialto, California, about 50 miles east of Los Angeles, and the man was aided by two friends. 18-year-old Ian Roman and 18-year-old Brian Fawcett. Rob's deceptive phone call ruse involved him telling a story where he claims that he sent his two sons to pick up Del Taco and that the restaurant had completely screwed up the order and put sour cream on everything. He claims that after getting this screwed up order, he called Del Taco corporate over the matter and was given the green light to get a free meal. How you doing, Rosie? My name's Robert Kennedy. I frequent your establishment about two to three times a week. And I'm calling uh, about an incident that happened uh, earlier. I talked to the manager. Uh, they were getting they were getting off at the time. They told me to call in uh, when I got home from work. Basically, what happened was I sent my son Isaiah and and my son Cody in for um, not a substantial amount of food, but for a good amount of food. And when it when the food came back, I told them to take it back. They had no receipt from the order and the order contained sour cream and I don't eat sour cream and at the same time our sodas were wrong and when I called I actually called corporate corporate told me to call the manager and that they will fix it so that's what I'm basically calling for it seems like Rob has like rehearsed this story like you gotta wonder how many times he's pulled this stunt now when it had become clear that the restaurant workers were buying his tall tale he would send Ian and Brian inside to pick up their free meal under the guise of them being his sons the two 18 year olds would go in and pick up the fraudulent spread the Del Taco evac was caught on camera by Rob's gang of scammers. Rob's minions would then return to his vehicle with a bag filled to the brim of Del Taco. The Tex-Mex kingpin could be seen braggadociously munching his spoils as the video comes to a close. The Del Taco scam was a complete success. Rob's Del Taco scam tutorial video was uploaded to YouTube on February 22nd of 2008 to the Nickel and Dime YouTube channel. Opinions from the public would quickly flood into it comment section, with many praising Rob for his elaborate scheme while others warned him of potential Del Taco retribution. This guy is a good con man. The simple details he adds really makes it more believable. The son's name, saying he has salmonella, etc. That seems like quite a lot of effort to go through to avoid paying even a few bucks for a few tacos. Using Del Taco's kindness against them? This is what makes the world a colder and less kind place. I hope this guy pays the maximum price under the law for this. He's a true jerk. Clever social engineering tactic. I don't think this was a good idea in any way, but I'll give the dude credit. He's a good talker. 
I frequent your establishment two to three times a week. Yeah, right. Looks more like 23 times a week. If this guy needs anything, it's not Del Taco. In the early days of YouTube, the Del Taco scam video was truly one of a kind, and it went viral, amassing tens and eventually hundreds of thousands of views. Unfortunately for Rob, though, this attention meant that the Del Taco scam video would eventually make it back to Del Taco themselves. Perhaps with YouTube being so niche at the time, Rob never expected his fast food victim to find the video. For this naivety, he would be punished severely. Apparently, a viewer who knew Rob in real life recognized him in the video and called police over the matter, reporting his fraudulent activity to authorities. With all the evidence they needed publicly viewable on YouTube, they promptly tracked the man down and arrested Rob. This obese fraudster was hit with a felony commercial burglary charge and placed on a $125,000 bond. Police had this to say about Rob after he was arrested and put in jail. He was quite proud of himself there in the video, but he cried like a big baby back here. Both Brian Fawcett and Ian Hobbs were also arrested due to their connection with the Del Taco scam. In March of 2008, Robert would plead guilty and was sentenced to serve 30 days in jail along with three years of probation and was completely banned from the Rialto Del Taco. After the conclusion of the case, the district attorney commented, I tried to get him to stay away from all Del Tacos, but the judge said just the one. As for Ian and Brian, unfortunately, I'm unable to ascertain exactly what their sentences were, but I would imagine it was less than Rob the Kingpin. Recording yourself scamming Del Taco is pretty stupid, but Rob has nothing on our next guy, an individual that went to jail over cold fries from McDonald's. Before we get into our next story, a brief word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored sponsored by Keeps, and to begin the ad, let's look at my hair from old videos filmed back in 2020. Yeah, as you can see, your boy was losing hair and losing it fast. I didn't want to go bald, so I decided to do something about my hair loss and got started with Keeps, and the results have been pretty insane. Here's me six months after starting Keeps, a year after starting, almost two years after starting, and then there's me now, nearly three years after starting Keeps, and I gotta be honest with you, your boy Always looking pretty good and I would imagine things would be quite worse if I never started Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the two FDA approved hair loss products at a can't beat price and best of all you skip the trip to the doctor's office and pharmacy. Keeps will set you up with a prescriber online and ship your prescription right to your front door and within four to six months you should start seeing results. I stand by Keeps, and if you're a guy out there that's having some anxiety about hair loss, there's no better time than now to start Keeps. Hair loss stops with Keeps, and if interested, you guys can go to Keeps.com slash Wavy to take advantage of Keeps' special offer. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Wavy. When a fast food joint gets your order wrong, it can be frustrating. But it's not the end of the world. In light of a screw up, most people ask the restaurant for a refund or simply wait around for them to remake the order correctly. However, there does exist a small cohort of individuals that have reacted disproportionately to a restaurant getting their order wrong, such as the folks who have called police over mismatched items in their bags. And yeah. what did the owner say to you? Well, I, I ordered a chicken sandwich, and this, uh, basically the owner, I told him right before I ordered, I can't eat tomatoes because I'm allergic. It goes without saying that it takes a room temperature IQ to think it's worth calling the police over a fast food order. But you know what's even more outrageously stupid? Doing this while you have an active warrant out for your arrest. Meet 24-year-old Antoine Sims. In August of 2022, Mr. Sims would enter and place an order at a Kennesaw, Georgia McDonald's location. This man, who was said to have been with his fiance at the time, found himself becoming frustrated at the length of time it was taking the employees to prepare his food. Nearly 10 minutes had passed and Sims was still waiting. The man eventually snapped, and with no receipt in hand, he questioned the cashier what was taking so long. Well, it turns out that Antoine Sims' order number had already been called and he didn't notice it because he didn't have his receipt. His food was ready and had been sitting out ready to be picked up for several minutes at this point. After this discovery, the man would inspect his meal, only to find that his french fries had become cold. Enraged by this development, Sims was said to have furiously demanded 
landed staff to make him some fresh french fries. The man has been quoted as saying this to management, quote, you better give me some fucking french fries, mother fucker. This situation was said to have escalated into a physical altercation with Antoine Sims allegedly throwing his food and drink at the McDonald's manager. Due to Mr. Sims' aggressive action, the incensed man was kicked out of the store by the McDonald's team, and he was told to never return. Antoine Sims was livid after being thrown out of the establishment, and in his rage, he decides to make a phone call. The vengeful man found it prudent to dial 911 and explained to authorities that McDonald's was refusing to supply him with a fresh order of french fries. After much haranguing, dispatch would eventually capitulate and send officers to the scene to investigate this french fry fiasco. A short time later, officers would arrive at McDonald's and police body cam footage would record Antoine detailing his dilemma. Um, I guess our order was called but we don't even know our order number. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So now our food is sitting there cold, so when I come up, I say, you know, I try to fry the fries. Or they're lukewarm, but they're not hot. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I just ask him, can we get some fresh, fresh fry? Okay. He said, okay, the fries are not hot. Touch the fries. I said, no, they're not hot. And at this point, you don't touch them, so you know? Yeah. Yeah, can I just get a fresh set? Okay. So is he getting the fries? And I said, can I also get the receipt? That was five minutes ago. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He, excuse me, sir, five minutes ago, I can I can run my store however I want to run my store. Okay. This now. Sir, I'm I didn't pay. He said, matter of fact, you can leave my property. Get off my property now. The ever so patient police collected his first and last name. Then they entered the restaurant to speak with the McDonald's franchise owner. The McDonald's workers would point out that Antoine was the aggressor, and the owner of the restaurant would also point out that he noticed a probation anklet on Antoine's leg, uh, basically suggesting that he thought the man was out on probation. He insists that he's you know, all his food's cold. Okay. He's burning my hands. So whatever. That's okay. you know, not you know, doesn't really matter. Okay. Took the next one, starts cussing me. You better give me that fresh fries, mother. Mm -hmm. He's like, what? Starts losing it. Starts shoving his food at me. Mm -hmm. And I said, sorry. He said, I said, well, did that, tell you what, you can take your business elsewhere. Give me a car. Give me a refund. No, you're not going to give me an effort refund. You're going to give me. Food and my money back. So I don't want to see that one ever happen back. Okay. I mean, dude's obviously on probation, got an ankle bracelet on. After speaking with the owner, it seemed as if police thought that McDonald's was in the right in this situation. The officer would then reapproach Mr. Sims and inform him that he was no longer allowed to go into the restaurant and asked him if he would be willing to sign an acknowledgement form stating such. Still hung up on getting new french fries, Mr. Sims wasn't thrilled about the development but kind of played ball for the time being. He does not want you coming back in the store. He actually wants us to come and really trespass you. So you will not be allowed back at this Sir, McDonald's. I, I don't even stay here. I keep, I it doesn't matter. He's requested it. We got to do it. It's not a big deal. It's so a piece of charge. No, we're not charging. It's a piece of paper we're going to give you. That's going to say, hey, you can't come back to this McDonald's. That's all it is. Wow. Like, yeah. No, just like, just realistically, did I do anything? I don't know. I, I'm not here to even figure that out. I'm here to I'm here to keep the peace. Now at this point, the officer would go back to his police cruiser to get that acknowledgement form that he mentioned. But while inside his car, he decided to do a little bit of investigation about the theory that Antoine Sims was a man on probation. He runs his name through the police database. And after running Antoine's name through his police cruiser computer, the officer was stunned to discover that the man had an act warrant out for his arrest. Turns out Antoine Sims had been arrested back in 2018. The man was suspected of being connected to the murder of a woman named Adeliza Mertovic. This woman was thought to have been accidentally killed in a botched drug deal, and prosecutors were alleging Antoine Sims of assisting the perpetrators in hiding evidence of the crime. Apparently, Antoine had missed a court date pertaining to this case while he was out on bond. Because of this, a warrant was put out for his arrest. The officer, who at this point was just stunned at the audacity of someone calling the police over something so petty with an active warrant, 
decided to play it cool and call for backup. He gets the acknowledgement form, goes back to Antoine with the intent of making an arrest. When the officer returned, he handed Antoine the acknowledgement form. The police commenced small talk, trying not to alert the man of his imminent arrest. Soon, additional officers would arrive, and at this point, Antoine Sims began to grow visibly paranoid. Seeing the situation deteriorating, police would go for an arrest, and it's at this point that Antoine runs for it. Can you come over here, man? No, I'm, I'm afraid of y'all, sir. Why are you afraid? I've three years, sir. I'm afraid of All right, you, sir. I'm, I'm going to walk you I'm, through. I'm, Why are you I'm doing afraid. that? I know how to fill it Why out, Why are you sir. doing that? I know how to fill it. Am I All right? Sir? Yeah. No, let's make it yet. Car, 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 car. The fleet-footed French fry complainant ran from police for some time and even allegedly attempted to break into an apartment building during the pursuit. But eventually, officers tracked Antoine Sims down, tased the man, and took him into custody. After arresting Sims, police would search his vehicle that he rode to McDonald's in and discovered 31 grams of marijuana. So in addition to being in trouble for skipping court, he now had an additional charge of possession with intent to distribute. Antoine Sims is now back in jail and awaits court relating to his alleged involvement in the death of Adeliza Mertovic. I'll end this segment with a YouTube comment under the police activity video showcasing the body cam footage of Antoine's arrest, which I think very well sums up the man's intelligence. This guy has the reasoning capabilities of a chicken McNugget. Enough said. Calling the cops over some cold french fries while you have an active warrant for your arrest is absurdly stupid. Antoine Sims would fit right in with our next harebrained fool caught up in a fast food disaster. That being the man who tried to impersonate In-N-Out Burger's CEO and got sued for it in civil court. In March of 2018, a man donning a suit entered an In-N-Out Burger establishment in San Fernando Valley, California. Introducing himself by the name John Trollston, the sharply dressed man presented himself as the CEO of the company itself. Trollston claimed that he needed a burger and fry meal from the restaurant so that he could audit the place's quality and make sure that it was up to in and out standards. Some of the employees at the restaurant took the bait and gave the man food, but the obvious prank attempt at hand was caught on quickly by one of the managers, who denied John Trollston the attention he was seeking. See, it turns out Mr. Trollston was actually an online prankster named Cody Roeder. Roeder had already successfully perpetrated a similar prank which was recorded in public published to his YouTube channel, Troll Munchies. Seeing through Mr. Trollston's ruse, the manager at this in and out establishment would call police over the matter. Upon realizing the police had been alerted, Cody, AKA John Trollston, hastily fled the restaurant and managed to escape the scene before the cops arrived. However, despite narrowly evading police confrontation, this wouldn't be the end of John Trollston's in and out CEO impersonation antics. Cody would continue this same half-wit prank, hitting another In-N-Out location in Burbank, California, claiming that he was the CEO in an attempt to get free food. In the Burbank attempt, he goes as far as making a public scene by stepping on a burger in front of the restaurant's manager and customers. Sir, sir, uh, I hate to say this, hey, but man, I need your seat. food's I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your burger. Sir, I need you to leave now. Yeah, yeah. Sir, this is just, it's, it's garbage. Hey. He would avoid police incursion in this situation as well, and his videos continued to go up showcasing him pranking in and out restaurants. But this Burbank incident would prove to be the last straw for in and out Apparently, prank channels had been swarming the areas and these in and out restaurants around Los Angeles for some time, with many customers and employees complaining to the company about being filmed by opportunistic trolls and influencers who would visit their restaurants. As a result of Cody Roeder's in and out Burger CEO impersonation pranks, Cody was sued by the company. Their lawsuit demanding that Cody be banned from in and out Burger establishments, that he pay them $25,000 in damages, and requested a restraining order be issued against the man that if violated would incur $1,000 of damages for each infringement. While the outcome of this lawsuit isn't public, videos related to in and out Burger were removed from the Troll Munchies channel, so I can only imagine that the lawsuit had legs to some degree.
In what's likely one of the most disturbing crimes in the history of fast food, we now get to our final fast food disaster, the story of the McDonald's strip search hoax. It's an incident involving a deeply unsettling crime that affected an 18-year-old employee, a crime that was facilitated due to the incompetence and negligence showcased by her management. On April 9, 2004, at a McDonald's location in Mount Washington, Kentucky, assistant manager Donna Summers was working her shift when she got a phone call in her back office. Summers picked up the phone, and to the woman's surprise, the man on the line identified himself as a police officer, a man going by the name Officer Scott. Officer Scott promptly informed the assistant manager that one of her employees, 18-year-old Louise Ogborn, was reported to police by a customer who claimed that Louise had stolen money from them at the restaurant. As a part of this policeman's investigation, the officer requested assistant manager Donna Summers to bring Louise to the manager's office and perform a search of the employee under the premise of finding this allegedly stolen money. Donna Summers was initially skeptical at the claims made by the officer. However, the man on the phone was able to accurately describe Louise's physical appearance, and the man was able to put together a believable story that Donna Summers eventually believed to be legitimate. Under the assumption that she was aiding in a legit police investigation, while still on the phone with the officer, Donna summoned Louise to her office. And from here, things take a bizarre Charlie Dark turn. After Louise was in the office with Summers, Officer Scott ordered Donna Summers to perform a strip search on the employee. Under guidance from this disembodied authority figure, the assistant manager meticulously searched the clothing of Louise, to the point where the only article of clothing worn by the woman was a restaurant apron. Nothing had been found on Louise throughout this meticulous search. In hindsight, it's clear that something unusual was going down here, but Donna Summers didn't necessarily see a problem with this very particular search that the officer was ordering her to do. After about 30 minutes into the search, with Officer Scott requesting more interrogation done on the woman, Donna Summers would apparently express that this investigation was taking too much of her time and was interfering with operations of the restaurant. The assistant manager would then leave the room and pass the phone along to another employee, 27-year-old Jason Bradley. Bradley was tasked with watching the accused Louise Ogborn until Donna Summers could return. Jason Bradley, now at the helm of the phone, began speaking with this alleged policeman. In subsequent interviews performed with Jason Bradley after this incident, the man claims that he felt that something was suspicious about the legitimacy of the officer on the line. 18-year-old Louise was terrified at this point, almost naked, and had been thoroughly searched with nothing found. The man thought, why wasn't the officer physically present if this was such a big deal. However, despite his suspicions, Jason Bradley would keep the phone line open with Officer Scott. After engaging in small talk with Officer Scott, sometime later, manager Donna Summers would return to inform those in the office of a rather unusual plan of action that was to take place. She informed everybody in the office that since the restaurant was so poorly staffed and that they were busy and couldn't really handle this on their own, that she had called her fiance, a man named Walter Nix, and this man would be coming to the restaurant to aid in the interrogation of Louise Ogborn. Walter Nix was not a a McDonald's employee and by no means should have been involved in this situation. But what becomes apparent as this story progresses is that Louise's management and her fellow McDonald's employees were deeply incompetent. After all, nobody had taken any action or raised an eyebrow at the concerning path that this bizarre investigation had gone down. An investigation being helmed by an officer that none of them had met. And sadly, Summer's boyfriend, Walter Nix's involvement in this situation, would cause the entire McDonald's strip search incident to become far darker. Walter Nix would arrive and man the phone sometime later, and what follows is two hours of Nix taking orders from Officer Scott on the phone. Orders that led to unspeakable abuse against Louise, 
including but not limited to sexual assault. The terrified woman feeling compelled to stay and endure this treatment under fear of getting in trouble with police. After being assaulted under orders from Officer Scott, Walter Nix would leave the room, and Assistant Manager Donna Summers would then send in staff custodian 58-year-old Tom Sims to speak with the police officer. Thankfully, Mr. Sims would be the man to break the chain of abuse that was occurring against this poor employee. Upon manning the phones, Officer Scott then instructed custodian Sims to remove Louise's apron. The custodian, who was already confused by the situation at hand, became extremely concerned upon hearing this request and felt that his fellow employees had played into the hands of some sort of twisted deviant, posing as an officer. The custodian immediately got assistant manager Donna Summers and explained to her that they had likely just been duped, asserting that Officer Scott was a fraud and his call was a hoax. It would be at this moment that Officer Scott would end the phone call. After this development, Donna had finally come to the same disturbing realization that Custodian Sims had. The employees had assisted some freak out there in abusing Louise. McDonald's upper management were soon notified about the situation, and it wouldn't be long until police would arrive as well. A criminal investigation and inquiry was launched into the abuse of Louise Ogborn, and authorities sought out to find the man that made the Officer Scott phone call. What Donna Summers and her employees didn't realize at the time of this incident taking place was that there was a serial hoax caller on the loose. An unknown man had been making threatening phone calls all around the U.S. to individuals and businesses impersonating authority figures and using blackmail to compel workers to perform sadistic acts that fulfilled his own sexual fantasies, most of which targeted fast food restaurants or retail stores. And after a long investigation, police would name a suspect. The man behind the McDonald's strip search call and many others was alleged by police to be 38-year-old David R. Stewart, a Walmart security guard from Panama City, Florida. According to police, David R. Stewart was found to have been in the possession of phone cards associated with call log data from the aforementioned abuse hoax calls, and police had surveillance footage of Stewart purchasing these very cards. As a result of what happened to Louise at McDonald's in Mount Washington, Kentucky, David Stewart was arrested on June 30th of 2004 and was charged with impersonating a police officer and solicitation of sodomy. Walter Nix, Louise's most serious in-person abuser, was brought in on charges of sodomy and assault. The man would later be found guilty and sentenced to serve five years in prison. Donna Summers, whose negligence helped facilitate the abuse of Louise, was convicted on misdemeanor charges and was sentenced to serve a year of probation. And what would become of David Stewart, the man alleged to have been behind this hoax call. Well, David Stewart was facing up to 15 years in prison for his alleged crimes, but during trial, the prosecution failed to provide any direct evidence proving David was the voice in the hoax call, as sadly, despite there being video recording from inside the McDonald's, the camera did not capture audio, nor was the phone call recorded in any other way. While police had connected him to the purchasing of phone cards related to hoax calls, the proof was only circumstantial in relation to the McDonald's case. Because of this, the jury did not find the man guilty, and he was acquitted of any criminal wrongdoing. Curiously, hoax calls of this sort completely stopped afterwards. The accused man has never spent a day in prison stemming from this incident despite evidence linking him to the crime, and he maintains a clean criminal record. As for Louise, the tragic victim of the McDonald's hoax call, in 2007, she would file a massive lawsuit against McDonald's, asking for $200 million in damages. Attorneys for McDonald's claim that the blame mostly belonged to Donna Summers for not recognizing the hoax and not the greater company. But in the end, they were found liable. Ultimately, Louise was awarded $1.1 million in punitive damages resulting from this case. And bizarrely enough, Donna Summers, the assistant manager, was awarded $400,000 herself in a separate civil suit filed against McDonald's. The premise of the case stating that McDonald's failed management by not informing them of the threat of hoax callers at the time. 
It's extremely frustrating that whoever was behind this call was never caught and brought to justice. And in all honesty, if you ask me, Louise should have got way more money than what she got from these McDonald's lawsuits. The legacy of this case is deeply unsettling to say the least. In my opinion, this is likely the most disturbing fast food disaster in history and will live on as a cautionary tale showcasing the abuse of authority figures and why one should always be weary when communicating with someone under anonymity. And well, you made it to the end. Let me know what you guys thought about the video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.